recording started, you can go ahead. Uh, your time slot is, you're a few minutes ahead. You have till 6.50. Okay, thank you. You need, uh, you need more. Uh, I may, I'm trying to trim the, I was still trying to trim the slides, so. All right. I, I have a demo, so I don't want to unnecessarily. Right. Go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Burhan. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, on the screen, and uh, I thought about uh, giving a talk because this is the this is a similar talk that I gave at the first bar camp, which was titled uh, Python in the work in the workplace, and that was in 2011. And uh, I have been programming Python well before that time, and then a couple of years since then, and I still continue to do that. Uh, but I wanted to share my experiences uh, with a new language called Go and why I think it's, uh, it's, it's good to know and it's important, especially if you are an existing uh, Python developer. Uh, but before I do that, let me just give you an introduction, a short introduction to Go. So this title is a Python's Developer's Guide to Go, but really it's just a developer's guide to Go or simply Go. That could be the title. <clears throat> okay, let's see how the slide, there we go. So this is the, this is the logo of Go and the, the underlying theme of Go is do less and enable more. Um, so what is Go? So Go is a programming language. It was created by what I call the giants of computing. So Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and uh, Rob Agresiver. If you don't know Rob Pike and Ken Thompson, these guys worked in, uh, uh, in, in Berkeley and they're, they're responsible for some of the core C and C languages. Uh, uh, Robert Agresiver, he's responsible for UTF-8, which I'm sure everyone loves. Uh, no, no pun intended there. Uh, and it was, it was created at Google uh, because Google realized that they were doing a lot of work in C and C++ and yes, even in Python uh, to take advantage of the multi-core uh, CPUs. Uh, the reality is a lot of programming languages that we use today, uh, they, were, uh, they were conceived many, many years ago when a single CPU was used and there was a concept of time sharing and CPU usage was, uh, was, was at a premium. Uh, and so all these programming languages are designed to run in single threads, single CPUs. You can do uh, concurrency and parallelism, but you need to be, you need to do a lot of work to get it done right. So Google realized that this is a problem that needs to be solved. So they have some of the brightest uh, people working there. So they decided to come up with a language and, that's, and that language is called Go. Uh, so why Go? So Go is designed for the ease of programming. This is uh, number one. And coming from Python, this may seem like a nice joke, but uh, as someone who loves Python and continues to write Python daily, and now I'm writing uh, production code in Go, um, I, I, I think it's a true statement. It just needs to be getting used to. It, it has a concise, deliberate, and clean syntax. Uh, so no semicolons, although, I recently learned in the initial version of Go, there were semicolons, but then they removed them. Thank God for that. And uh, it's, it's concise. What that means is that the language is very terse. It, it's, it's, it's a very small language. Uh, there's not a lot that comes out of the box. Uh, and what, what is given there is designed for a very specific and obvious purpose. So just to give you an example, when Go first came out, the encryption libraries were not included. And slowly they added those into the into the standard library for Go. So it's a very concise, very very uh, simple programming language in terms of its content that you have to learn. <clears throat> the, one of the key things about Go is that threads are cheap, fast, and easy. Uh, uh, pick all three if you like. Uh, this is important because one of the key pr problems um, facing today in most programming languages is how to make sure that thread contention and memory management and uh, not having corrupt memory headers and synchronization. Anyone who's worked in C or C++ can attest to that. It's a real problem. So Go makes that a lot easier. It's portable. Uh, this is one of the things that drove me to it, to be honest. Uh, uh, portable means that there's no runtime with Go. So you don't have to install anything. Like with Python, you have to install a Python interpreter. Uh, with Java, you have to have the JVM. But with Go, uh, it's not like that. Go compiles down to native binaries and you can ship them and they're all self-contained. And it truly is um, remarkable that in this day and age, uh, we don't have a way to write code in operating system A, 
that works really well in operating system B without having to go through a lot of hoops and knowing, this, and knowing the specifics of operating system B. Java was supposed to provide that uh, with the run one and write one and run everywhere promise, but well, I'll leave that to you guys. It has first class tooling, it has a powerful type system. As a comprehensive standard library, it's open source and doesn't chase features. That's really important. So the Go standard library is, and, and the Go programming language is designed to be minimal. So they will not add things most famously like generics to the language. So before I put you guys to sleep, uh, let me just keep going forward so I can understand. So this is basically the blog post that uh, launched Go to the world. And uh, just, I, I'll, I'll, not, I'll let you guys read it, but basically what they're saying is um, they, they would go because dynamic languages like Python, uh, which perform safely, but, um, uh, but, but, they're, but they're not designed uh, for communication threads and, they, and, and they're not designed to take full advantage of multi-core CPUs. And then uh, Ryan, who is the developer of Node, uh, he came out and he said that, yeah, Node was designed for this, but actually uh, Go is, is better at it. And he actually left the node ecosystem and he started working on Go. So Go has a lot going for it, no pun intended. Um, so uh, this is, um, sorry, my mistake. So this is how programming languages uh, usually are. So um, you have fast for humans and then fast and efficient for computers. And if you see, I think my slides are messed up. Um, so uh, this is where Python sits. So it's obviously Python is very popular because it's very fast for humans. It's very easy to get started. I love it. I've been writing code in Python for a long time. Ruby, I have mixed feelings. Perl, I don't want to talk about today. Uh, JavaScript, I really don't think it should be here. I think it should be somewhere, I don't know, down here below my desk. Go is sitting right here. Uh, it's, it's kind of halfway there. So it's actually fast and efficient for computers because it compiles and it's fast and fun for humans as well. Uh, and then you have... Um, so after Go, what happens is you get these languages down here. You have efficient concurrency. So in, in this slide, you see it's just fast and fun for humans and fast and efficient for computers, but it doesn't talk about concurrent programming. When we talk about concurrent programming, you're all the way down here. So in concurrent programming, all the languages that I was talking about, JavaScript, Perl, Python, and Ruby, they're all the way in this bottom corner. They are inefficient and it's very hacky to write very, um, very good performant concurrent code. On the other hand, C, C++, and Java, they're very good at uh, uh, concurrency, but it's very difficult to write very good concurrent code in there. And this is where Go shines. So Go is, um, it's re it has extremely good concurrency uh, primitives, and it's really, really easy to, uh, to write code. And so that, that's one of the reasons that kind of drew me to it. And of course, it always helps if you have lots of logos on your slides. So uh, here's my token slide with logos of companies that, that, that use Go. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, obviously, uh, Google is not here cause well, actually it is here, uh, but they also obviously use it. Um, so a lot of companies are moving a lot of their systems programming, their backend code, their API servers to go because they, it can really take advantage of a lot of the CPU cores that are, uh, sitting idle. So what are some of the use cases for Go? So all any kind of servers, uh, you can think of any kind of backend you can think of. Um, anything that has to do with an API, anything uh, ideally that does not have um, a front end, although that is possible with Go. Web applications, machine learning tools, image processing is very, very good. Uh, load balancers, extremely excellent. A lot of API tooling and toolkits are written in Go. Of course, if you're not aware, Docker itself is written in Go. Uh, system tools, I'm talking about scripts that run on servers, uh, command line helpers. Hardware hacking as well. It has a version that is extremely efficient that runs on very, very micro hardware as well. Of course, uh, scripting and backend processing. These are all the good use cases of Go. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, but let me just uh, stop here for a second and kind of explain uh, the things that I don't like about Go. So one of the things that I really appreciate about Python is it, it has a REPL. So a REPL is R-E-P-L, uh, read, execute, uh, something, something, something. I forgot the acronym. But basically what it is, it's, it's a quick way for you to evaluate expressions in the language without having to download an IDE or uh, in, install the tooling because uh, Python is interpreted. Go is not interpreted. Go is compiled. So Go, in, in order to do quick experiments with Go, you have to actually uh, write the code, uh, compile the code, and execute it. The good news is that um, once you stop cursing at Go because it doesn't have a REPL, you realize that the build cycle is so fast 
that it really it, it really doesn't make a difference and and you and you get a lot in terms of type safety and and those things that can keep up uh, in, in in bugs that are that are difficult to maintain if your types are uh are, are not well defined or disciplined just ask anyone who's ever tried to debug a java application or javascript code that uh, uh, about type safety and i'm sure they'll give you a, a long tail so i actually have some examples of go uh, some example codes uh, just to simply just to give you an idea of what go looks like so i'm just going to go through a couple of these and i'm going to go through all of them uh, due to the time constraints so uh, i have shifted my screen so let me know if you can still see my screen yes yes okay so this is what a uh, simple go um, program looks like. So this is basically, uh, before I start, this is the Go playground. A anyone can go here, play.golang.org, and you can write Go code, and you can basically play with it. So this is a nice way for you to start experimenting with Go without having to download or install any of the Go interpreters. So every Go package, uh, every Go file belongs to a package. Uh, by convention, package main is the one that's, uh, uh, if you're creating an executable, you have to have package main. Inside of you have to have a function main. Note, it's called func not function, or I have had many cases where I do this uh, because I'm so used to Python and uh, the compiler barks at me. Uh, import statements um, and some of the quirky things about Go, uh, usually in many other programming language, uh, you would type, uh, if you want to declare a variable, you declare the type and then you say X, right? In Go, it's for reasons beyond my comprehension, it's the other way around, you say X int. Okay, this is one of the few things that you'll have to Get used to. Uh, similarly here, you can say uh, f is int, q is a string, z is a float. Just run this and you'll see the output all the way here. These are the default values. So this is basically what a Go uh, program looks like. I'll tell you some of the cool things about Go that, you, that, that you'll appreciate uh, once you start programming, once you start sharing with others. Uh, Go uh, has a very strict formatting requirements. Um, you, you notice this format button. So if I do something really weird, in, in, in Go, like if I um, do like this, uh, if you format it, it'll, well, this is, a, this is a syntax error, obviously. But if you, if you do a weird indentation, or if you try to do this, or um, have your code like that, like many of my C programming friends love to do, um, there is a very standard way to format code, and it's built into the Go runtime. So there's no argument about tabs versus spaces, is it should be four or two, or should the curly braces go? All of that is taken care of. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the examples, but I will share my slides so you guys can, and these are public. So all of these examples point to the Google Play Playground. So you can all, um, for example, if, if you click on this one, um, it's this link and it's always available. So you guys can go and have a look um, at this. So I'll leave it with that. And then this is my, um, uh, this is my last slide on the, my truncated, Example, so uh, I'll give you some tips from my uh, understanding of Go, and I've been writing uh, Go code now for uh, since last year, uh, and then I've, I have some code in production now. So the documentation is very detailed, um, and uh, it, it takes a bit of time to getting used to it because it's, it's written by people who are very good programmers but not very good documentation writers, unfortunately. Um, uh, so uh, these are the two books that I would recommend uh, you go, uh, this one, the blue one, uh, this is like the Bible of, or, excuse me, this is like the reference documentation for Go. It's a bit thick in that you have to have a big, you know, I, I measure the book complexity and how many coffees it takes me to get through it. So this is like a four double espresso book. Uh, this is more like a latte skin milk book, the one on top. So uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, these both books are, are really good. There's an excellent um, Golang book reference. This website, Go by Example, is very good. Uh, of course, the, the, the Golang, uh, the, the playground I mentioned, there's uh, these, uh, this is the official documentation site. So you can go there and, and you can explore. Uh, of course, Visual Studio Code has excellent, very excellent support for Go. Uh, just recently, in fact, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, uh, Microsoft released that uh, plugin to the Go uh, community. So now, uh, before it was written by Microsoft, and now it's written by Go. Uh, now it's going to be managed by Go. There's also GoLand, an IDE from the guys behind uh, from JetBrains, uh, and all, it's also very good. But I would recommend you avoid this. You you avoid GoLand unless you're comfortable with Go because it assumes you have some level of complexity and some level of understanding of the Go ecosystem. So it it gets to be a bit confusing. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I realize I've been talking extremely fast and, and, and uh, 
And my next uh, slide, my next uh, section is actually a demo of um, a quick server that I put together to just to give you an idea. So unless there are any questions that are pressing, I'll, I'll go ahead with the demo. Uh, there is a question. Uh, okay, if we have time, we can, we can take it. Do you want to take it now or after your demo? Uh, let me just go through the demo because the, uh, the demo is really quick and sure. I'll have uh, some more sure. time for the show. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, I'm going to switch my screen. So please let me know if you are not able to see it. Uh, let, me, uh, let me try this one. Um, do you see my screen? But the code is a bit small if you can, the font, can you? Yeah, zoom in? yeah, yeah, this is, this is just a, uh, this is just the prompt. So I'm not going to be um, loading my code here, but okay. Uh, what I'll do is uh, just do this and then I'll load it in my editor where I can. So uh, I don't think you guys can see my editor. So let me just make sure uh, you guys can, here we go. This should be. Can you guys see my code? Very tiny. Uh, how about now? Yes, fantastic. Okay. Uh, so this is this is a simple uh, server, right? This is a simple web server. Uh, it listens on this on this port. Uh, whenever a request comes here, it runs this function. This function has a specific signature. This is how. Um, you have uh, so go doesn't have the concept of uh, classes or objects uh, it's a purely uh, it has types and you can create custom types and you can have interfaces on types so whenever a function satisfies an interface uh, it, it is considered of that type so just just some background for you uh, so any function that's that has this as a parameter satisfies the type that is required to be passed in to handle func which is a method of http that maps a URL to a handler. So any function that you write here, it could be an inline function, it could be a Lambda, that satisfies this signature will be called, and then you know it, it'll get passed in the response writer and then the request, which is a pointer. So Go has the notion of pointers. And then basically fumped, that's how you say this, it's not FMT, don't, don't ever say that. I made that mistake, I got yelled at. Uh, so this is fumped. Any uh, so, uh, okay, uh, let me pause a little bit. Go does not have the notion of public or private that you might be used to from Java and other languages. Instead, it has the concept of visibility. So anytime you have a Go file and you want to expose something to other Go files, you just make the object have initial caps. That's it, that's all that's required. So since this has caps, uh, this is capitalized, I can pull it from the HTTP uh, uh, module. So I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example of how that works. So if, if I write something here like this, uh, um, this function is not importable by anyone else. It's hidden by definition. It can only be imported in those other files that are part of the same package. However, Watch what happens. If I, if I do this, now this function uh, becomes exportable. Anyone can import my uh, package, will get this. And you'll notice that it gives me a squiggly underline. And it says that exported function, hello, should have a comment or be unexported. So this is the level of um, quality or let's say the uh, standards that the Go uh, community enforces. And uh, in my opinion, it's really good because it, it forces you to write code that it's easier for other people to understand. So basically to resolve this, all I have to do is I have to put a comment up here. So I can just say uh, this function uh, does something uh, silly. Uh, however, uh, as you notice, the squiggly underline is still there because it says that the, the actual, oh, let me say this. Now, it says that you, it even tells you how the comment should look like. Um, you see how you, you, you see how they are saying the now, Of course, this is a, this is a warning, so I don't I can I can safely ignore this. But it's a good practice not to, especially if you intend to share code or if you intend to work uh, in open source projects, because it just makes life easier for everyone else involved. So the way you write it is, hello is a function. 
that does and of course i mean obviously this doesn't make any sense but just to get rid of the, the warning i did that so all right so this is a simple go um, code uh, to run it i just open a new terminal here uh, this is by the way visual studio code uh and then i can just say go build because you have to build it uh, oops main.go and it's saying ah because i'm in the wrong directory that's why it's saying that so work uh, projects and then by temp there we go now it'll work so um it'll give it a, give it a second because my poor computer it's built correct and how do i know it's built because um i have this lovely executable in windows so i can simply just run this and the code is running, and to prove it to you that it is that it is running, in fact, I can just go to my browser, and I will share it with you in a second. Um, I'm just going to open uh, that port, and I can uh, let me. Oh, I know you guys can't see it. Just bear with me, please. Uh, I think this is okay. And so, can you see my browser? Um, so I'm just gonna do. Uh, and you zoom in? Yeah, we can see it, but zoom in, please. Yeah, okay, here we go. So, um, so you can see that the server is running. If I type, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, so this is running fine. So you're saying, okay, Brahan, so what? I can probably do this in one line of Python. And you're right, you could. I mean, but here's here's the, if you could look, here's the, uh, the sauce that makes it extra special. So I'm going to kill this, right? So now I have this executable. And in order for me to run this server on any other Windows system, all I have to do is ship this executable to someone. They don't have to install Go. They don't have to install any other libraries. They don't have to do anything else. That's one of the best things about it coming from Python. Because as, as I'm sure you guys know, if you're Python developers, the first thing you have to figure out is, hey, is Python installed? Number two, are all my libraries installed? And you have ship requirements files. You may be able to ship an executable or a package or all that headache goes away because with Go, uh, you, you simply get binaries. And here's the other thing. So I'm on a Windows machine, obviously, uh, but I can do this. And as simple as that, I can take my same code let me give it a second. You're going to see a, okay, here we go. So now it's, it's built for me, um, a binary. Uh, I don't think you guys can see it. Let me just, uh, do this and that. So now it's, uh, it's built me a binary here. Um, that is that I can ship to any 64 bit. Um, no, oops, that doesn't work. That word that that does. So it's built for me a binary, uh, a Linux binary from the same exact code base. And I can run this on any uh, Linux uh, server. So um, just, to, just to see that in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do WSL. And I am in my, in my same directory. And now I have the same exact binary here. And if I do, uh, you will see this is a, ELF 64-bit executable for uh, Linux. It's statically linked, right? And it's a go. It has this go build ID, which is which is a random string here. But um, you can you can actually tag your Go code with certain pieces of like let's say you have a file that should only be running in Linux for some reason. You can put comments in your Go code, and the Go builder knows that only build this component for Linux. Anyways, just to say, just to see that it if, if that it works, I'm just going to run um, this file, and it's running. There's no output to it, but if I go to my browser now, I should be able to just refresh this and get the same result. And this is actually running on my Linux uh, a VM here. So this is this is the reason. This is the main reason that I got into Go. Because I realized that if I can write code and have it shipped to a server, especially given that Go is designed for server programming, it's a systems programming language, right? So this means I'm writing backends, I'm writing API um, handlers, I'm writing code that talks to payments systems. And I want that code to be as portable as possible. I don't want 
there to be any ambiguity when it's sent to someone. I don't want there to be any issues like, oh, I'm missing this version of library. And Go really does that really, really well. And it, it has a nice uh, balance um, between the classical languages that allow cross-compiling and a language that's a bit more modern and, and, and easier to use and designed specifically for this. Um, so that's the uh, end of my short uh, demo. I, 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 I hope it was short. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I will open it for any questions. Uh, thank you. OK, we have, uh, thank you very much, Warhan. Awesome uh, introduction. We have four questions for you so far, or maybe sure. five. Um, first question, is it worth learning for a beginner, or should I stick to Python? I don't know what beautiful lines of code should look like, so that's not exactly a differentiating factor for me. Uh, yeah, so I would say that in this day and age, uh, it, it is worthwhile to learn languages that are specialized for a, for a specific function. So if you're doing any, any manner of data science or any kind of um, anything that has to do with a lot of uh, what uh, Abdurrahman was, uh, was mentioning in his talk earlier, Definitely go with Python. I still write code in Python. Uh, and I, I just think that as a, as a developer, um, it, it's important for you to be able to ship code reliably, especially given that uh, you might be running code in environments that you may not have full control over. So, I, so just as a, as a matter of background, uh, I'm, I work in a bank, right? I'm, I'm the tech lead. Uh, in a major bank and in banking, we have issues such as you, you don't have access to the internet. You cannot install things. The environment is restricted. It's very difficult to get things wrong. We don't have the luxury of having our own servers uh, that we can bring up and bring down. And in, in those scenarios, uh, it's it's a bit of a challenge to get a, a Python code or, or, or even other code like Ruby that's interpreted that, that, that has requirements on the systems. And in terms of maintainability, it's also a, a bit of a headache. Um, I, I write, as I mentioned, I write a lot of Python code, and I know that to maintain Python code consistently over the lifetime of an application, it requires a lot of um, juggling of versions and, and, and interpreters. So um, that's, I guess, my, my long answer to it. Uh, the short answer to it is uh, Go is one of the fastest growing languages in the world. It's one of the most desired languages in the world. Uh, it still hasn't reached Python levels of, uh, in you know, of notoriety, but uh, it, it's rising. And, and I think it's, it's worth your while to at least experiment with it, for sure. Thank you for the answer. Uh, next question is, what are your thoughts on Go versus Julia? Uh, I, to be honest with you, I have not looked at Julia. Um, so I, I, I really can't answer that, but, but let me give you an answer by comparing Go to uh, another language that, that often uh, comes up uh, in the same spec uh, is Rust. So uh, I've also written some code in Rust um, and people say, okay, if, I, if I'm going to go for a systems programming language uh, that is uh, not as uh, beginner friendly, quote unquote, as Python, why should I choose Go versus Rust? Um, so Rust is, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rust. Rust is a programming language developed originally at Mozilla. Uh, it's designed primarily to have a very uh, minimal memory uh, contingent issues, memory bugs issues. It's very, uh, it has a very unique memory sharing model. And it, it, it is very, it is an extremely type safe language. Uh, in fact, uh, th there was, th there are many studies online, but one of the studies that really caught my eye said that uh, 90% of bugs that happened in the Firefox browser were from memory mismanagement. So the Firefox team came out and said, oh, sorry, the, the Mozilla team came out and said, like, hey, we need a better way to solve this. So this language is actually uh, actually shipping in, in Firefox. I believe it runs one of the core components that parses the DOM there. And it, it's been such a eye opener that Microsoft recently in their, their build conference uh, made the announcement that they have decided to um, write another language uh, that based on Rust uh, for, their, uh, for their own systems that is type safe. So, uh, however, the, the comparison between Rust and Go, is, uh, there are a lot of similarities. 
in my opinion, Go is a lot easier to get started with. Uh, it doesn't um, slap you as hard as Rust does if you make a mistake. Um, but in, 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 uh, in defense of Rust, Rust has very good documentation. It has an excellent, excellent, excellent beginner's guide. The, it's called the Rust book. It's available for free online. I actually have two copies of it. I don't know why I bought two. Oh, I remember because the, there was an update. Uh, and uh, it has very good documentation. However, uh, I would still give my preference to Go simply because um, it's in my, in, my, in my experience coming from where I had completely forgotten about C and C++ and Java and Fortran and COBOL and all those other languages that I used to code in. And I was so deep into Python that I thought this is the best way to go forward. Uh, Go was uh, not as rough of a transition uh, for me. Uh, Rust is, yeah. Uh, so I, I, that's the best way to answer that. I'm sorry, I don't know the Julia programming language uh, to give you a better answer, but hopefully that gives you some context. Okay, next question. Could Go be used as an application development platform or are there plans for it in the future? Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. Um, I don't understand. What does it mean, like application development platform? Uh, Hussein, maybe you can clarify uh, either privately or in the chat or for mobile applications. I guess, uh, can you use Go for mobile application development? Ah, can you use Go for mobile? No, um, not, not, not as of yet. Um, there are some uh, rumors that there is a runtime being developed, uh, excuse me, uh, for Go on mobiles. But I can tell you, there is a micro Go, which runs on microcontrollers. And that is taken off like nothing. They managed to reduce the binary size, just to give you an idea on compiler optimizations from 15 megs, which I thought was pretty small, to five which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. I don't know how they did that, but anyway, um, so it's not yet ideal for writing mobile applications. However, it is probably the best language to write mobile backends. Unfortunately, I did not have time here to, to give you guys uh, an, a, a demo of uh, some code that is written in Go. I actually have, um, uh, I did a study. I I had a program. I had an application running in Python that was running in production, and uh, I rewrote that same application in Go, just to compare the performance and how how easy would it be for me to um, get that uh, get that application to be more performant. And I had a very simple benchmark for it, and I found out that with Go, not only was the binary smaller. Obviously, I didn't have to ship all those dependencies with it but it was very simple for me to take advantage of all the threads that were available, available to me, not only on my computer, but also on the server. So, uh, and it, it, it brought down the application performance. Uh, so this application has a hard runtime limit of two minutes. Basically, no matter what size of input, it has to finish in two minutes. Uh, and so I was able to bring that down. It was running one minute and 20 seconds in Python. And I managed to bring it down to 40 microseconds. I, uh, uh, the, the one that looks like a uh, the one that, the, the, that looks like a U. I forgot what it's called. But microseconds Micro. when when using microseconds, right? Uh, when when using Python, it, it was so fast I thought it had crashed. To be honest with you, I kept firing requests at it and just uh, you know, uh, yeah, um, it, it, it was pretty amazing. I, I actually thought it was not doing the right job, uh, and then obviously I did a lot of other optimizations as well. I got rid of the files and writing temp files. I used a, bit, a bunch of memory stuff and I started using a lot of threads. I started backgrounding a lot of tasks, which was a lot, which was a lot easier to do in Python. Uh, sorry, in Go than it was in Python. And so it just made life a lot easier. That, that really convinced me that um, it is the way to go if I'm writing anything that doesn't have a user interface or rather the interface is for uh, systems and not to people. I hope that I know that didn't answer your question directly, but I hope it gave you some more context. Um, I have three more questions for you. Okay. Does it bundle the libraries packages within the EXE binary? Uh, so when you, if you use uh, the, uh, the standard library, quote unquote standard library that comes with 
uh, Golang, then yes. So uh, the example I showed you, it uses the net HTTP package and the uh, fund package, and it's it's in, it's built in, inside the binary. You can also ship additional uh, um, uh, blobs and your own custom binaries, uh, your own custom code as part of the binary. So it can make what's called a fat binary. So there is uh, there, there is provisions to do that. Uh, all the all the code that I have written so far, and I'm not an, uh, just so. Uh, disclaimer: I'm, I'm not an expert in Go. I, I have run into a lot of problems with it, and I and I and I seek the help of you know a lot of more experienced people. But um, what uh, from from my experience so far, of running a couple of production applications with this, uh, I've I have yet to run into a problem where I had to ship uh, something that wasn't a configuration file. So um, typically, what we do is we we read from the environment. Uh, so we do the twelve factor in our applications, but we also ship files that can override the environment variable because sometimes it's it's a lot easier to override the environment vari variables locally rather than having to override the environment. So that's the only thing I had to ship separately from the binary that I generated on my machine when I was writing the, the, the server components for this application. But I know there's a way you can embed um, additional code and third party libraries within the binary. So I have code that uses um, open source libraries that are written by people from GitHub. And when I compile and build a binary, I don't have to ship anything extra with it. I just ship the, um, the, the, the binary file to my server. Okay. Second, yeah. uh, next question is, is there a way to make it dynamically linked in Linux or does it have to be statically linked? Uh, I would, I would question why you'd want to have it dynamically linked. Um, Personally, I think it would make sense to have dynamically linked uh, libraries so that you always have the libraries up to date rather than relying on the developer to keep things up to date. That's my point okay. of view. Mm. I, I have a counter argument to that. Mm -hmm. uh, my counter argument to that is that the state of your running applications uh, should be uh, static. So they, they should be ephemeral. So if there is a library that needs to be updated, you should update and patch that app and ship it with that. Because if you, if you rely on libraries in runtime being updated, then you will run into a problem where you will run into bugs with, that are because some library was updated without your knowledge and that update has some obscure bug and now you don't know what that issue is. Um, so uh, I, I have been bitten by this a lot of times with Python uh, and other programs that we run. So for my, my recommendation is, uh, so okay, to answer your question, I have yet to have it ship with um, dynamically linked libraries. I doubt that it's possible because it is a self-contained binary that's generated. However, don't quote me on that. As I said, when you started recording these calls, I am not sure that the, if that is the full truth, but. What I do know is I've built it on Linux and it always builds with a static, uh, it's, it's always statically linked. Anyways, getting back to my, my argument, my counter argument to your point, I think it's, um, my experience has taught me that whenever you have a, a, a possibility of configuration drift, you always run into obscure bugs in your applications. And that makes life a lot, a lot difficult. So my recommendation would be if you have to update a linked Library, uh, I would always recommend you ship your binary with that library, or at least in the in the case of Python, you do a hard pinning of the versions. So that's my answer to that. Sorry, I don't have I don't have a lot of real direct answers to your questions. I'm not that. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll get a couple more months of experience with Go, and then um, I'll have better answers for you. Okay. Uh, one last question is: Is it worth developing REST APIs using Go? Uh, how better would my API? Uh, how but be how better would my API run versus something like Django REST framework? The answer to that question is yes. And the answer to the second part of the question is also yes. <laughs> Very simply, uh, I have migrated an application that was exactly that stack. Django and uh, in fact was using Django REST and I migrated that to Go. Here's what I learned. It's amazing what you can do when the programming language comes out of the box with a very strong network library 
and very strong uh, primitives on doing JSON transformations. To give you an idea, um, I don't know if I have time, but uh, in, uh, in Go, uh, let me see if I, have a, if, I, if I have an example, I'll, I'll share the link. In Go, to convert something to JSON is as simple as tagging the property with the word JSON. That's it. And since Go by default is UTF-8 everything, I cannot tell you, uh, okay, let me pause <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off track here. So uh, one thing that I, th that I also realized is, um, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but if you have a pull request or an update that deletes code, this is the best thing you can ever do. Because that just means your application has less chances of having bugs. So one of the biggest things I realized is when I shifted that application from Django REST to Go, I end up deleting a lot of code. I'm talking in orders of like six, like it was 2000 lines of code I had to get rid of. Simply because I didn't need all that cruft. All that came out of the box written by someone way more smarter than me. And I did not have that much of a surface area to bother testing and validating. So that's why I, I would always recommend um, do a use case study, uh, convert a piece of code that you're familiar with uh, to go run it in parallel. It's very, very easy to do that. Go runs pretty much everywhere. And since it's just a binary, you can always run it on your laptop somewhere and just validate that it's working fine and do the performance checks. Oh, speaking of which, Go comes with a built-in performance and benchmarking tool that you can use to validate that your code is actually, how, how is it going to perform uh, when, it, when, it's, when it gets hit by millions and millions of requests? So it's built into the, to, to the Go tooling. So um, that's, how, that's how much they are confident in their, in their performance things. So um, that's, that's my answer to that. Uh, last uh, one more question is, uh, would you recommend building REST APIs in Go using the modules included with the language itself or other modules? No, uh, with the modules included in the language. There's no need to go sh uh, ship, uh, shopping for other mo uh, modules when it comes to uh, Golang. Um, it has a built-in HTTP server that I, that I demoed today. Uh, I actually use a very uh, lightweight framework called Jin, go-jin is, uh, is the thing you need to Google. Basically because it does things that I'm used to, uh, which is uh, like having middleware and doing logging, uh, doing Prometheus statistics and you know all that good stuff. So I, I, I use that because it just makes writing boilerplate code a lot easier. I'd rather spend time writing some other stuff. So that's about the only thing I can recommend. Other than that, uh, all examples that I've seen and all recommendations I've seen is with the standard library in Go, you can get a long, 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 long way before you, uh, before you start uh, needing to use other uh, third-party libraries. In fact, it was one of the things that uh, kind of was um, an eye-opener for me when I first started out because I'm so used to a pip install stuff and just run that. But I realized that in Go, the standard library is designed for a, lo a lot of stuff that you would have to rely on third-party libraries for. So whatever you could have done with a third-party API framework, in Go, it's just a maybe 20, 40 lines of code and, and, and you have something you know, extremely um, performant. And I, was and I was hesitant to do that, to be honest, because I always, my reaction was, why am I writing something from scratch that is not, um, that is not my primary business logic that I'm trying to uh, solve? That's like saying that I, if, if I want to write a, a web application, I should first start writing the web server. But in Go, um, the issue is that it, it's, it's, a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a different philosophy. The, the tools are so good and the, and the standard library is so performant and so strong that it's just five lines of code. The, there are a lot of guardrails around you to stop you from doing something stupid. For example, there's a built-in race detector uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that helps when you're writing concurrent code. And I've been, uh, it, it's pointed out a lot of bugs in my applications because of that. So because of all that, I would say that use the libraries that are built in and, uh, and you'll be fine, you'll be fine. All right, uh, one last question. It's an extension to something that was already asked on uh, sure. Rust versus Go. Okay. Uh, Jimaz is asking, 
there are companies who are switching from uh, Go to Rust, uh, such yeah. as Discord. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on what these companies are doing? Okay. Is it uh, worth for him to learn uh, Go or simply switch to Rust? Why are these companies switching? Okay, um, I, will, I will answer that uh, in a simple way. Chances are you are using technology for technology's sake, not because the problem demands it. Sounds a bit weird, but here's, here's a, what, what that means. And I'm guilty of it, and, 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 and I do it all the time. So basically what happens is you, you want to solve a problem, and so you go looking for a technology that solves a problem, but the, the thing is, it's not um, writing a solution to use a stack, it's writing a solution to solve the problem. So uh, companies that shift from Go to Rust, one of the main reasons that they do, uh, that they do do, that they do that is because uh, Go has a uh, built-in garbage collector. Right, it, it it reclaims memory, and that um, companies have found that since Rust does not have that, so one of the key things with the, with the Rust is it does not have a garbage collection mechanism. Um, they found that at their scale, it was a lot more performant to move the already fast application that was running in Go to Rust simply because of the context switching that happens when you do garbage collection was something that they wanted to optimize. So in my uh, in my opinion, at that scale, it makes sense to write specialized components in specialized languages. Uh, however, uh, again, uh, writing it in Rust would not necessarily make the solution any better if the solution itself is not something that, that needs Rust, if that makes sense. So, you have to realize that Rust uh, takes a lot of getting used to in terms of understanding how the borrowing mechanism for memory in, and, and, uh, uh, and, and those semantics work in Rust. It, it's, it's one of those things that's unique about Rust and it's one of the things that's hardest to wrap your head around because all, um, the majority of languages that came before Rust took care of this for you behind the scenes. And because they did that, there is things like context switching, there is things like garbage collection, there is things like uh, constructors and destructors. Um, and perhaps the language that didn't do that uh, well was C, which is why C is a lot of, it, it's a very dangerous language to write a memory um, specific code in because it's very, very easy to get a lot of um, the famous stack overflow errors, the famous buffer overrun errors, and you know null pointers and those things. So um, I would say that make sure that your solution uh, you understand your solution really well. You understand the problem really well. And that's when you should come to a decision on what technology to use. A lot of these um, posts that you see online are simply using technology for technology's sake, not using technology for the solution's sake. So um, I, that's the best way I can answer that. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Burhan. Uh, we have gone... Uh... Uh, I know, I 30 apologize. Minutes, 30 minutes beyond the talk time, but if you permit me, uh, I actually, uh, it's not a sales pitch. I know that's not the boss, <laughs> but I, 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 am, I, I am working towards a Go course. Uh, it's going to be free. So that's why I said it's not a sales pitch. Okay. Um, it's going to be free and it's going to be a comprehensive overview of Go uh, from very beginning all the way to writing. API backends and doing monitoring and, you know, uh, deployment. So if anyone is interested, um, the, uh, you guys can get in touch with the Barcamp team or uh, I'm Burhan on Twitter. You can just ping me uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, about the interest and we'll get to go. So I already have majority of the coursework written. It's going to be a multi-day course. So mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not one of those things where eight hours I'll sit and I'll bore you. Uh, there'll be a lot more gophers in my presentations. You saw the gophers in my presentation? Yeah, Those yeah. Are cute. awesome. That's one the, uh, I, I, forgot, I forgot to mention that's the only reason I sh shifted the language. It's one of the best reasons to, sh to shift the language. Um, and you can, you can create your own by going to this link, um, gopherize me. So it's G-O-P-H-E-R-I-Z-E dot -E, M-E. 
And uh, uh, I, I forgot to mention, I had a slide with credits uh, for the icons and everything. I should have shown that, but I just realized I uh, So the, so, uh, the, the, the Gopher uh, icon is made by uh, Ashley McNamara. She works at Microsoft. Um, and Gopher is me is a, um, is a website, uh, is a service you can go to, you can create uh, millions of combinations of gophers. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, okay. Um, thanks, uh, Shema. So Shema just mentioned that I, I can still share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm the, uh, the comedy act that takes the show out. So I will, I will, sh I will share my screen. So, uh, uh, so this is basically, um, uh, so this is this is the website I was I was mentioning. Um, it's called GoFrize Me, and uh, you can it's just go showing. and create your own. Uh, oh is yeah, it? yeah. Okay. So, it's still loading. Okay. Yeah, it was still loading. So, yeah. so basically, you can create your own gopher like this lovely guy here, and then you can randomize him and shuffle and reset, and you can get. So there are 216 billion possible combinations um, uh, of uh, of gophers that you can create. So you can see it has different kinds of shirts. Uh, and then, you know, facial hair, uh, glass. I actually have a version that looks like me, but uh, he's too scary. So that's why I don't put him on, on, on any of the slides. Um, but I did have uh, my, um, my, my last thank you slide, which has the link and it has the credits uh, for, the, uh, for Ashley McNamara, who created the original uh, Gopher icon. So thank you. Okay, I will definitely stop talking now. Uh, because I'm, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm yeah. going to stop recording. Thank you.